Okay. So here is the uh, special issue, which is the occasion of this um, webinar and the link there that you can follow uh, to look further. And as I mentioned, we have a very broad uh, view about what counts as ethics, about right and wrong actions, qualities of character, we should lead, what counts as a good society and a flourishing planet, and what responsibilities humans have for each other and the ecosystem. So that's the very broad interpretation of ethics that, that we're applying and many of our authors are uh, in this article. Although having said that, each one of us has our own take on ethics and it is certainly a contesting subject about what precisely counts as ethics. Um, but it's our experience, um, and I'll be interested to hear about your experience, that quite often community development workers on the ground are suspicious of ethics. Certainly they have been in the past. And when Peter Westerby and I um, edited a book on ethics a few years ago, and I see Peter's here in the audience, um, one of our motivations was, was to try to put ethics on the agenda and open it up uh, for further debate and discussion. And we still feel there's much less literature and courses on ethics in community development than perhaps there should be. Um, and often I think community development workers associate ethics with professionalization and codes of ethics. Not that professionalization is always a bad thing, but we can be very suspicious of codes of ethics as prescriptive and top down, that these are codes, sets of principles, values, even rules uh, prescribed by a professional body uh, with colonial implications, really, the imposition of a set of values from a certain perspective, which Pradeep will talk a little bit more about shortly. Often we associate ethics with individuals making difficult choices. I'm a community development worker and I have to make a choice between breaching confidentiality or uh, protecting a child, whatever it might be. Those dilemmas and seeing the individual as the only as the person who is responsible and has a choice and has some autonomy, a very kind of Western view of ethics. And finally, and particularly important for community development workers is it can seem like a distraction from the political side of the work, which is really why we are all in there, uh, analyzing power structures and looking at the, the structural uh, constraints uh, on um, community action, community development. And it can be seen as responsibilizing workers and communities. You know, it's down to me, the worker, to solve my dilemma. Whereas the, the real problem is with the, um, the state, the government, the um, multinational firms who are causing the unemployment, the poverty, etc. cetera. Um, so those are some reasons for suspicion, um, which is why we feel we need to develop a broad understanding of, of ethics. And Linda mentioned microethics in the article on conversations at a barbecue. And that, in that article, um, the authors are talking about the everyday minutiae of relating to people and interacting, how you look at somebody, how you position yourself, uh, the emotions that are going through your head. And these are often invisible. We may not even talk about them to other people and we're probably not writing about them very often. And we think of this as an inevitable part of practice, but ethical issues are in that, of course, because it's about compassion, empathy, care, uh, dignity, and a whole range of other things. We're also very familiar with the, the, the macro level in terms of seeing it as, as politics, which I just mentioned about the distribution of power and resources. But of course, ethics is deeply embedded in that. And it's very important that we see um, issues of power, resources and politics as also being issues of ethics because they then uh, contribute to us seeing it as, as something that we can take collective action to try and change. The article mentioned about food sovereignty um, and the, also the, art, the, the article from India on the stigmatization of um, different castes uh, is a very uh, important in looking at those macro ethical questions. Um, and the bit in the middle is what we often think of as constituting the ethics, what we call the mesoethics, where we're trying to develop strategies for community development, engagement and action. So um, in the article uh, from uh, Korea uh, with Korean uh, development workers in Africa, 
the issue about whether or not to uh, give bribes in order to get a community building uh, built. And Dave's uh, article about uh, a community-based contract is about trying to work out how best to be ethical uh, in your practice um, and how to handle some of those, uh, those challenges that arise. So often it's that middle bit that we take to be ethics, and that certainly is the core of ethics, working out what to do, how to do it, why, what's good, right, wrong, etc. But the ethics is also deeply embedded in the everyday practice and in those political questions that probably spur our strategies. So all those are intertwined and very important and we need to have a view of ethics which is broad enough to encompass them. Um, and looking at community development through an ethical lens is really what we're trying to do in this special issue. So taking everyday practice, taking the political issues and, and the challenges and asking who's benefiting, who's being harmed, who's responsible, what needs, interests, rights are at stake and what structural constraints are in place. And these are always present in community development, but by actually put, sh shedding an ethical light on them, we become more aware and perhaps make things more visible. And I'm now going to hand over to Pradeep, who's going to take up this theme of community development as a colonizing practice. So that's really looking at the, the macro ethics of what we're doing in community development. So over to you, Pradeep. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think uh, uh, within that domain of uh, micro, meso and uh, macro, I think what is really, in, uh, really uh, interesting, which came out while, while studying all the articles and uh, uh, analyzing it is that uh, um, while we are looking at community development as a as a, as a practice how it needs to be within the domain of ethics uh, but in a, in an overall in a scenario is 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 community development itself is becoming an instrument of uh, of a colonized existence is something when we have to look at it. And some of the things like the first one is on the funding part of it. How, who funds the community development from where is it part of the, uh, some of the macro institutions which are, which wants to promote structural adjustment program and uh, whether community development is just another instrument to push that agenda. In that case, how will you look at the ethics, overall macro ethics is the thing. And, and second, uh, the Margaret's article uh, very well puts, puts up in, in terms of, are you, are you, if you challenge that part of colonization, uh, will you end up uh, essentializing colonies as somebody who are just merely the victims of the past without any agency? And doing that, are you going to be on the wrong side of ethics is something which is a bigger question mark into it. And the third is about the cultural relativity. Here also the dilemma is that uh, one respect for local culture is a is a, is a, is a, is, a, is a is if you bring it within the domain of ethics. How about challenging certain uh, certain things in the culture? How will you bring space for it? If you don't challenge it, is it ethical? You know that that dilemma of uh, of within the cultural relativity is another area which uh, thing and which is and within that uh, global south itself you will have a longer challenge of community uh, doing their own research community researcher or uh, non community researcher studying community and that insider perspective which Shakila brought out is is an is also a domain where how we link it with the macro thing. And while we were trying to find, uh, you know, answer to it, but somewhere, I think uh, we try to try to put it as at the end, uh, who owns it and how you define ownership, and also how you define community. I think these are a few areas uh, which we have put for a as loose threads uh, for further studies, further research, and all. And it's a, it's I think it's an ongoing process of. Uh, uh, learning which we all are having as uh, decolonizing community development. Yeah. I'll stop here. Thanks. That's very um, pretty. And uh, I'll now move on to Linda, who's going to take us uh, really beyond uh, what's in uh, this special issue to post human perspectives. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
Yes, we're, we're talking here about macroethics at a very macro macro scale. And I guess I'm conscious that this is one of the big challenges of our times to think about ethics at this large level. Um, I'm sure this kind of imagery is really well known to you. I've taken it off a heap of CD organisation websites. I think even the IACD's website's image is there. Uh, whenever you Google the phrase community development, you'll get a picture of this. So we're pretty clear that people are at the heart of what we do. There's also um, a whole heap of images of disembodied hands, which I mean, I assume we means we like to do stuff, join hands and get our hands dirty. So there's something about human beings and activity that seems to be at the heart of community development. So it seems that pretty fundamental to CD is a sense of human agency and with its focus upon change for advancement or improvement of a condition, community development seems to hold an intrinsic assumption of the human actors who participate and in doing so make possible the participation of other humans. So you could argue that without human agency, the project of community development becomes quite unintelligible. So even arguments for climate action and environmental justice are often framed in terms of preserving ecosystems so that human beings can survive and thrive. And from an ethical standpoint, the post-human perspective asks, what would it mean to decenter humans from ethics? What might it mean to engage with ethics if we challenge the idea of humans as being the only agents of the moral world, or we cease to invest in human exceptionalism and the placement of human beings at the top of some kind of moral hierarchy? Because that moral hierarchy is used to justify sacrificing other animals, plants, fungi, and microbes for the benefit of humanity. So Donna Haraway is somebody who writes a lot about post-human futures, which she names as a, a time when species meet. And she argues that what we actually need to be doing is thinking about how do we think beyond the interests of our own species to be less narcissistic in our conception of the world and to take the interests and rights of entities that are different to us seriously. And the extension of that is to a much broader assemblage that would include not only other animals, but plants, microbes, water, earth, air, robots. So it's, it's how do we expand this sense of what a community is? Um, and Haraway has this very pithy slogan, make kin, not babies. Uh, and when she says that, she's not actually being anti-children. What she's suggesting is that we need to think about humans as being entangled and embedded in a much broader world of codependency. And if we begin to understand that, then we can reverse some of the destructive narratives that have you know, guided the transformation of Earth. And so instead of this distinction between human and non sorry, human and non-human, she presents a much more liquid worldview in which actors are equal and move in and out of each other as subject, object, nature and culture. I might flip to the next slide, um, Sarah, if you don't mind. Um, and I guess my questions are that if, if we embrace a really broad sense of community, that community is beyond people, then what then are the implications for CD and what ethical and practical questions might emerge? And if we push that, at what point do we cease to be talking about CD and we're actually talking about something else like systems theory or ecology? So it's kind of how do we push our thinking in CD and how far can we push it? I don't know what the answer is to that, but I suspect it has something to do with thinking about how we embed responsibility and care, how we reinvigorate the commons, how we think about a kind of ecological humanities and how we embrace Indigenous knowledges and how we begin to deconstruct the binary at the core of environmental thinking, you know, to move beyond that binary of sustainability and extinction. Um, and I'm, I'm just reminded of Clark's work right back in 1978 where he said that the place of human beings could best be understood by recognising the interdependence of millions of species and the key to claiming kin is appreciating that the secretion of thought is less important for the whole than the ability to fix nitrogen. So I guess what all I've, of this is about is how do we engage community development and engage in these broader ecological discussions? What, what would a post-human CD look like? Thanks. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, 